Are you okay? Someday we'll find it The rainbow connection Lovers The dreamers and me The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen Legion, you may want to before watching this video. In my Terriers video, I discussed FX's initiative titled There Is No Box, which sought to encourage outside-the-box thinking in their burgeoning original programming lineup, alongside pushing the boundaries of violence, language, and sex that advertisers would be willing to be associated with. While most seem to regard There Is No Box as a creative directive, Noah Hawley seemed to take it as some sort of personal challenge, imbuing his spectacular television anthology adaptation of the Coen Brothers classic Fargo with dazzling style choices as well as some truly out there, but truly effective, narrative choices. With Fargo turning out to be such a success, FX put their faith into Mr. Hawley to work his magic again, handing him the keys to a second series titled Legion in 2017. Legion performed well enough to run for the entirety of its planned three seasons, and while on premise alone it may seem very different from the relatively grounded crime thriller Fargo, in execution it's clear the same creative voice was working behind both. If you're a Fargo fan, there won't be a doubt in your mind that the same showrunner was in charge of Legion. His fingerprints are all over this thing. Though with Legion, Noah Hawley's avant-garde style is thoroughly unleashed. The guy managed to turn Midwestern mobsters into a mind screw, so you can only imagine what a field day he'll have with a toy box full of super-powered individuals. And not like laser-eye, lightning bolts shoot from my fingertips superpowers. Body swapping, memory visiting, astral plane walking superpowers. Yeah. Legion is a trip, so let's all expand our consciousnesses, pop your Thorazine, and fasten your mental seatbelts. This is Legion. Legion tells the story of David Holler, a man who spent his youth as a troubled child and has recently been institutionalized with schizophrenia after a failed attempt to take his own life. Treatment proves effective for a while, as David settles into a happy norm at the Clockworks Psychiatric Hospital, passing the time chatting with druggy BFF Lenny Busker and striking up a mutual first-love relationship with Sidney Barrett. Despite her pathologic fear of physical contact, Sid and David have a whirlwind honeymoon no contact romance in the booby hatch. But when Sid is due to check out of the nut house, David can't help but plant a kiss on her, sparking a series of chaotic events. David swaps bodies with Sid. The psychiatric hospital is molecularly disrupted, disturbing patients and killing Lenny in the process. And shortly after, David is snatched up for interrogation by the sinister government entity known as Division 3. In light of recent uh, events? David comes to the realization that schizophrenia was a misdiagnosis, and he is instead some sort of telepathic, telekinetic superhero, mistaking his power of literally hearing voices in his head for madness all his life. It's a lot to drink in, especially when Division 3 is still trying to gaslight him into thinking he's crazy so he doesn't kill them all with his mind. You're saying after you entered the body of a woman and escaped from a mental hospital where all the patients had magically been sealed inside of their rooms, you think you saw me getting out of a car? Well, you don't have to be a dick about it, and yes, it was you. Sid comes to rescue David with a handful of other superpowered mutants, and they whisk him away to Summerland, an off-grid haven where mutants can come to terms with their conditions and powers in peace. Meanwhile, Division 3 snatches up David's sister Amy as bait. We know, you know, we have her. You want her? Come walk into our obvious trap and get her. And that's the initial premise of Legion. Under the guidance of camp counselor Melanie and her memory projectionist right-hand man Patonomy, David is going to revisit his memories and hone his powers until he's strong enough to rescue his sister from Division 3, and most notably their shape-shifting, clairvoyant henchman, the Eye. But while memory work is typically a therapeutic experience for the mutants who come to Summerland, it soon becomes apparent that something, or someone, is living in David's head. That's right, the guest has an uninvited guest in his noggin, and his brain is the gray matter equivalent of a cabin in the woods built on an Indian burial ground. This thing burrowed into David's brain when he was a boy, maybe even a baby, and it has been there, feeding on him. 
That's the basic premise of season one. But let's double back and go through the series premiere. David's daring journey of self-discovery as he reflects on his sinister past actions in his youth, strikes up a romance with Sydney, winds up in a cold government interrogation cell, gradually realizes he is the master of his fate, he is the captain of his soul, slips the binds of his G-Man captors, and comes to terms with the fact that his madness was superpowers all along. It's a captivating little plot that perfectly utilizes the puzzle box storytelling the series would come to be known for. But I did kind of feel like it was a self-contained pilot. Think you're crazy? Get nabbed by baddies? Learn the truth of your powers? Big explosive escape puts a bow on everything? Show's over. The pilot almost feels like a one-off movie, and it's not until episode two where David's sister gets kidnapped to give him the your princess is in another castle motivation to mount a rescue attempt against the monstrous Division Three. Kick some ass. Save the girl. Get a snack. They'll kill us, you know that, right? They'll try. After the pilot, the first half of season one depicts David's induction to Summerland, where mad scientists and psychics can poke and prod at his mind to find what makes him tick and make him feel at home within his own psyche. Much like the premiere, the point of this string of episodes is to put the viewer in David's mentally destabilized shoes by being deliberately disorienting, a name which the Legion production team certainly accomplishes. But given how convoluted the rules of memory work are, only exacerbated by David's unique mind, meaning the already wacky rules have additional caveats when it comes to him, it's clear why the show is infamous for losing people early in its run. So like, imagine watching Harry Potter, and they're explaining the rules to like, Quidditch, but on top of trying to absorb all the dumb, made-up fantasy rules, suddenly all the magical balls and brooms and whatever started working differently than the expository characters said they would because Harry has the girl who voiced Grumpy Cat living in his head. Legion isn't for everyone. If you're someone who, for example, didn't get Inception, I mean, don't knock it till you try it, but God help you if you try to get into Legion. Like I said, Legion isn't for everyone, but the start of the run post-premiere makes it seem like the show is barely for anyone. And I have to imagine a lot of people who would really enjoy the first season as a whole got filtered by the first few episodes because of how intentionally impenetrable they are. For the record, I wasn't talking to myself, I was talking to Carrie. Wait, I thought, I thought your name was Carrie. Yes, it is. So you're talking to Carrie, just not the Carrie that happens to be yourself. Correct. Legion becomes less of a haze and more engaging when the reality of what's really making David insane in the membrane starts to crystallize. It's clear some telepathic being has taken up residence in David's subconscious as the ghostly specter of his deceased friend Lenny, with the endgame of hijacking David's immensely superpowered physical body for herself. People being get outed is now a recurring thing in the shows I've covered, along with people falling in love with being unable to have physical intimacy due to supernatural circumstances, long-term couples rekindling the fire after one partner loses their memory to sci-fi amnesia, cows in science labs, and getting something lemony in people's eyes. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Jesus, sorry. I, I'm sorry. Oh, shit. What is that? It's so just... lemony. Oh, it's God. not that lemony. Shit. It's just a hint of lemon. Legion's plot only gets more electrifying when David decides he's leveled up enough and storms Division 3 to rescue his sister, just as Lenny decides the kid's finally ripe for full-on puppeteering. Division 3 may have made an imposing first impression, but the power of David combined with the experience and brutality of his parasitic Geppetto means those poor fools don't stand a chance. Hey. Coming across David's no-clipping massacre at Division 3, the Summerlanders deduce the existence of David's parasite and race to rescue him. Reunited, the gang is attacked on two planes of reality. To save everyone from Division 3's hitman the Eye, opening fire with a Tommy gun in the physical world, David freezes time. And to save Sid from being assaulted by his mental demons in the astral plane, David sends them all to the cornfield, an illusory version of Clockwork's psychiatric hospital. Unaware that their physical bodies are pinned down by 45 ACP rounds frozen in stasis, the cast accept their new reality as patients in a mental, mental ward, with Lenny as their psychiatrist. The hospital fantasy that concludes season one is where Legion really hits its stride. The real fascinating element is how the cast's superpowers have been erased and recontextualized as coping mechanisms in this fictitious world, much like how David used to perceive his life. I haven't gone into the supporting cast yet. Frankly, the supporting characters were another weakness of the early episodes. By effectively establishing David's paranoia, we as an audience felt an innate desire to keep strangers at arm's length. And that desire was only amplified when the Summerland players went about their onboarding in a clandestine, cutesy speaking in riddles through the looking glass bullshit.
bullshit way that would obviously spark further paranoia in a recently escaped mental patient. So it's an absolute triumph on Legion's part that the writers are able to win me over on all of these side characters in minutes, with the clever yet clear and simple way their psyches are examined through their now lost powers. Melanie's husband Oliver was a powerful psychic who lost his mind in the astral plane, so she froze his body in the hopes his consciousness will one day find its way back. In the dream world, she's a widow, unable to cope with the loss of her husband. Carrie and Carrie are two people who share the same body, one a scientist who stays out of trouble by letting his other half take over when trouble comes knocking, the other an adventurous scrapper who hides in his body as a means of skipping through the boring parts of life. In the dream world, they're a codependent couple. Botonomy had the power to revisit people's memories with perfect clarity in the real world. In the dream world, he obsesses over his tragic inability to change the past. Events we later learn he'd more often than not just like to forget. I like to think I'm a time traveler. I go back, back, back. But all I can do is watch. The premiere of Legion really lit the spark of David discovering his capabilities, and the rest of season one has been about slowly unraveling the mystery of just what the hell is going on inside his mind, specifically when it comes to the sinister force that has been feeding off him since childhood. From a starting place of being utterly confounding, the audience has slowly pieced together which way is up, and the penultimate episode of season one is ultimately about sitting the audience down with not one, but two astral plane know-it-alls who can put a tidy bow on the topsy-turvy dream world riddles of Legion by explicitly walking us through exactly what's going on, stumbling upon Melanie's adrift, astral plane walking husband Oliver, whose memories of the real world and the wife he left behind have all but faded. Carrie finally has a mind reader on his side who can reveal the origins of David's parasite the truth behind the hospital fantasy, and the predicament their physical bodies are temporarily trapped in. Isolated and end the hospital fantasy. Unfreezing time and executing your friends in a hail of bullets, unfortunately. Unless we can physically change the dynamic of the room, block the bullets, move the bodies. Sometimes explicitly spelling things out to the audience can come across as patronizing, but the psychedelic dreamscapes of Legion more than warrant it. It's an explanation so nice, they do it twice, with Sydney basically doing a bit like, let me make sure I got this plan right, so when the super weird, super awesome Bolero climax of the episode begins to unfold before our eyes filled with tears of disbelieving joy, the show won't have to slow down to explain what on God's green earth we're watching. So what we have to do is distract the monster, who looks like Lenny but isn't, so we can save our bodies without her knowing, and then find a way to end the hospital fantasy and save David. Our second authority on the astral plane is David's rational mind, personified as another, more British David, and dragging us to a mental lecture hall to explore Lenny's master plot in greater detail. Okay, we can stop calling the parasite Lenny now. Farouk. Amal Farouk the Shadow King, seemingly a well-known real-life supervillain in this universe. Hitching a ride on the David Brain Train wasn't just a means to an end for unlimited power. It was also an act of revenge. See, David just found out he was adopted, which means his dad was probably a mutant. A mutant with a lot of villains. A lot of villains he defeated who would want revenge, including good old Farouk here. So daddy sent David to a foster family to keep him safe. And presumably, we're in a universe where powers are a like-father-like-son thing, which would mean that David's dad was Professor X. And no, I'm not doing my bit where I refer to characters by fake names that jokingly reference their role in the story. Sorry, by the way, to the people who believed the fake suspect in the third season of iZombie was actually named Red Harrington because I called him that in my retrospective. Though I can understand your confusion, that name would not be out of place in the iZombie universe at all. But yeah. David's dad is Charles Xavier, Noah Hawley's schizo tizzo psychedelic psychological horror show with an unreliable narrator and nonlinear storytelling and horrific nightmare monsters from beyond the shadow of the mind's eye. Yeah, it turns out this is all a big Marvel thing. Sorry, did I forget to mention that? Though this is alternate universe Elseworlds fair through and through. All this to say, you don't need to be caught up on the latest X-Men and MCU films to know what's happening. And we're probably not getting a devil with the yellow eyes meet and greet in Disneyland's Avengers Campus anytime soon. Walking, talking, fungus. What do you think I'll say? The penultimate episode is an appropriately crazy showdown for such an innately crazy show. With all the big questions running throughout the first season answered, going into the finale, there was only one big question left to be answered. How the hell are they going to top that? Well, for a series that has strove for unconventional storytelling to an almost pathologic degree, the season one finale is, somewhat disappointingly, 
you know, speaking of this being a Marvel thing, it's kind of a conventional superhero ending. The scientist character whips up a device to counter the powers of an unprecedented supernatural entity in an afternoon, like he's Walter Bishop. Although, naturally, damn it, I need more power! Reroute from the auxiliary batteries! That inevitably falls short, and the real table-turning move comes from an act of true love. The hero and the villain blast each other with different colored energy until the hero's color of energy wins, the villain sneaks away so they can come back for round two next year, the heroes join forces with the previously antagonistic Division 3 so we can do the whole heroes and shadowy government agency working glove and hand thing, and there's even an odd post credit scene that the follow-up entry barely addresses. Is it bad? No. In fact, I found there was a certain charm to the simplicity of season one, in contrast to the two seasons that would follow. That despite the twisting mind over matter logic of the world, the narrative ultimately boiled down to a straightforward and uplifting journey of self-discovery, with a dastardly villain to overcome and a girl to get in the end. This in stark contrast to later seasons, which would attempt to wrestle with themes just as mind-bending as the visuals, with execution struggles along the way, especially when it came to the aforementioned getting the girl. I've seen sappy and sweet romances in television that only get better as the result of a later season breakup, making them bittersweet in hindsight. But the, we'll get to it, but let's just say messy end of Sid and David's relationship retroactively makes their junior high-esque courtship in the pilot almost creepy on a rewatch, but we'll get to that in season two. Season one of Legion is a wild roller coaster ride, with solid performances throughout, but fleshed out more specifically by the left field casting choice of Audrey Plaza as their primary big bad. I've alluded to the strength of her equally creepy and infectiously villainously endearing portrayal of Lenny, Farouk's main avatar, throughout the video, but let me really give her her due now and just shower on the praise. She steals the show in year one, and going into Legion's sophomore year, with Oliver becoming the latest host of the literally too possessive Mr. Farouk, she now gets to do a double act with Jermaine Clement as cosmically powerful evil henchman. If that's not a hook to stick around for year two, I don't know what is. Would you like to swing on a star? Oh. Hitching a ride with everyone else on their way out of the astral plane, Oliver is finally freed from his decades in limbo. Unfortunately for his wife Melanie, Oliver's time away from reality has left him with little to no memory of their marriage, though it's undeniable there's still a spark there. Even more unfortunate for Melanie, only a few hours after returning with her, Oliver runs off with another man. Not that it was by choice, since that other man is, of course, Amal Farouk, commandeering Oliver's body for a little globe-trotting joyride so he can go on the hunt for his original body. Farouk is dangerous enough as just a mind parasite, but were he ever to reunite with his physical body, his true potential would be unleashed in the world once more. So the race is on for the combined forces of Summerland and Division 3 to find Farouk's corpse first and, I don't know, turn it into meat pies. On your mark, get set. Off either side. Go. If you were concerned about getting too comfortable now that the show has explained everything that's going on, don't worry. Legion Season 2 quickly gets to work, confusing the shit out of audiences all over again. It's been a year since the Season 1 finale, though David spent the year in the Season 1 post-credit Pokeball and perceived the passage of time as only a few hours, an event you would assume would have significant ramifications on the dynamics between characters, but which the series sweeps under the rug pretty much instantly. Time bending only convolutes things further when a vision of Sydney from the future appears, instructing David to secretly aid Farouk in his quest to literally find himself, because some apocalyptic event is on the horizon and they're going to need Farouk's help to save the world. So David and Farouk strike up an uneasy alliance. Farouk gets his body back if he promises to be on his best behavior, he and David can join forces to save the world, and to top it all off once he gets his body restored, he'll be free to release Oliver and the captive consciousness of Lenny. Everybody wins. They taught by killing me, they will save the world. And now you're telling me that the opposite is true. It's always a ton of fun to see heroes team up with fan-favorite villains, and the reveal of Farouk's true form is an exciting new revelation. I can imagine some people might take issue with the real Farouk being presented as this philosophizing, sophisticated Hannibal Lecter-esque figure, which is at odds with his portrayal last season as more of an over-the-top, hammy, sadistic Joker type. 
It makes sense to me, though, because, one, phenomenal cosmic powers means you need to get in character and commit to the bit when you're shapeshifting, Robin Williams genie style, and, b, making grand plans to LARP as god then getting your ass kicked by a hippie commune is gonna hurt anyone's confidence. So I can understand the desire to dial the showmanship back for round two. The entire cast going, it's a mad, 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 mad world in a race for Farouk's body is ostensibly the story of season two, but don't be fooled. Finding the big W Farouk is buried under is the focus of the very beginning and very end of the season, but Legion season two largely ditches the serialized television structure of the first season in favor of pseudo cases of the week, a shift I wasn't particularly fond of. These cases come in two flavors. Either an SCP besieges the Division 3 headquarters, and it's up to the gang to stop it. Or rather, it's up to David to solo it, because the rest of the gang is useless this season. These paranormal showdowns are fun enough, and they manage to be at least tangentially related to the looming Shadow King showdown to come. The second flavor comes in the form of Journey to the Center of the Mind character focus episodes, which range from at best being hauntingly thought provoking, if narratively flow breaking, to at worst, actively making me dislike the character they're focusing on. The show has a nasty habit of placing these episodes immediately after a big cliffhanger, and given the already languid pacing of season two that makes you wonder if they're going to find Farouk's body buried under the fireworks factory, these trippy thought experiment episodes that could have served as quiet and impactful breather episodes are harder to appreciate in their context in the series. Boardwalk Empire season three blew up enough nightclubs and ironed enough faces off to earn Sunday best. Breaking Bad Season 3 killed enough cartel hitmen and fucked enough Teds to earn Fly. So, well, Legion's Many Worlds episode that explores multiple alternate futures for David had he never been sent to Clockworks is intriguing. At the same time, you'll likely be restless because the bulk of the episodes preceding it have just been people walking back and forth through the same Division 3 hallway set with occasional CGI Dreamworld cutaways. That was a complaint people had about Deadpool as well, that half the movie took place on that one bridge just with a bunch of cutaways. I guess that's just the R-rated X-Men spinoff curse. Let us go talk to the professor. McAvoy or Stewart? These timelines are so confusing. Aside from David's exploration of remedial chaos theory, the other character focus episodes take the form of Psychonauts-esque adventures into dream worlds modeled after the host's fears and desires. These provide some incredibly memorable minimalist yet striking visuals, though the writers are openly concerned that the audience won't get the underlying character trait the fantasy world is meant to convey, so after a few minutes in each character's brain, David all but turns to camera and explains the symbolism to the audience. The side characters of Legion initially left me cold in season one, and though I was impressed that the writers and performers were able to do a lot with a little and win me over on them big time right before the finish line via the hospital fantasy, season two has a heavy focus on jaw-dropping visuals over both narrative and character, and they're the first casualty. I think the fake Melanie that's secretly Farouk gets more screen time this season than the actual Melanie, and Sid doesn't really raise an eyebrow at the fact that Melanie is able to put on a holographic, omniscient presentation about David's history despite not having powers, or the fact that Melanie beat everyone else at Division 3 in the race to the geographic anomaly desert where Farouk's body is hidden, again, despite not having powers. How did you get back here before us? Uh, uh how did we, Kronk? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. The Carries have a few playful moments where they realize they're going to have to exist without each other one day, and the Lady Carry needs to learn how to survive in the mundane world. But they sort of get lost in the shuffle of the David Farouk future Sid storyline in the season's second half. Potonomy dies, but none of the characters seem all that cut up about it. And we manage to upload his consciousness into a creepy hive mind that strips him of all his personality and individuality. So he's basically fine. Speaking of the hive mind consciousness, that brings me to the new addition to season two, Admiral Fukuyama. Fukuyama is probably the ultimate demonstration of Legion season two's commitment to visual flair over character depth. He's the leader of Division Three, who dresses like a Skyrim shopkeeper you're about to rob, who separated his mind from his body and uploaded his consciousness to a computer in a tree to prevent mind readers from discovering Division Three's plans. And he communicates through a cadre of androgynous androids. Visually, it's one of the wildest characters you're likely to come across in the pantheon of all American American television. As far as narrative importance and character depth, he's a complete nothing entity. His biggest role comes in a late season episode where the majority of the cast are brainwashed by the rumor weed from VeggieTales into attempting to kill him. And my only reaction to the potential stakes of Fukuyama's death was, good, blow his fucking basket head off. See what I care. And lastly, we have Sydney. There's just, there's a lot to unpack here. I'll do my best. Throughout the season, the audience starts to learn that future Sid may not be the best figure for David to put his trust into. It turns out the apocalyptic happening that they'll need Farouk to stop is David, 
and rather than traveling through time to talk David off the villainous path, she's exploiting his blind faith in her to effectively engineer his death. A fairly callous ends justify the means ploy, but with vague ends given we don't get much insight into what exactly David does in the bad future or why, alongside the heavy implication that David destroying the world is a stable time loop self-fulfilling prophecy instigated by future Sid betraying him in the first place. I know. It's cold to do that to someone that you used to love. Used to. David and future Sid may have trust issues, but there's plenty of trust issues going on between the present day couple as well. Sid fears that David may be getting intimate with her future self, which she considers effectively cheating, and David initially neglects to let present day Sid in on his secret alliance with Farouk. When Farouk kills David's sister and uses her corpse as a vessel to bring back Lenny's soul, which was intended as a twisted sort of gift to David but doesn't go over all that well, you'd think for someone who can read minds he'd know better, David and Farouk's tenuous partnership is disbanded, and David revisits his original plan of beating Farouk to his own body throwing it into a wood chipper. Sid's fears that David is potentially becoming a supervillain are not assuaged by his increasingly sadistic quest for revenge. Jesus, Archer! What, Lana? I said it was a rampage. Still, though! And most contentious of all is Sidney's dreamscape episode. With the influence trapping all the others in their mind palaces destroyed, Sid elects to remain trapped in hers anyways. Somehow. With David in her head on a mind journey to rescue her, she forces David to relive formative moments from her life over and over until he comes to the correct emotional conclusion about what she's trying to teach him with all these flashbacks. It's the psychic equivalent of your girlfriend saying, I'm fine, but she isn't fine. She's just not communicating with you, so you just have to figure out what's wrong. Can we go home now? Women. So that's a little tedious. The lesson she's ultimately trying to impart to David is that the pain of our past gives us strength. And that's where things start to get really dicey. Because most of the traumatic childhood memories we see are Sid inflicting pain on other people. So they read more like guilt, not pain. Using your newly discovered powers to get even with a high school bully is understandable. That's a staple of growing up for any superhero, and at least she didn't take it as far as the Chronicle Kid. But then we get to Sid's first sexual encounter, swapping bodies with her sleeping mother, then hooking up with her mom's new boyfriend in the shower, since anyone she tries to get physical with in her own body, she'll just swap places with. This experience was referenced in the first season, but she neglected to mention the fact that their bodies swapped back mid-coitus. Rather than revealing the truth of her power, she allowed her mother's boyfriend to have a seat over there and take the fall as a sex offender. Having one of your heroes rape someone is a pretty good way to lose audience sympathy for them, and having them frame that person for rape after the fact is just rubbing salt in the wound. Let's not beat around the bush here and pretend I don't know what happens later. The show should know this is going to kill audience sympathy, since David completes his journey toward villainy in the season finale, and the final nail in the coffin is a scene where he uses his powers to effectively rape Sid. If you're already taking David there, and using your powers to trick someone into sex as this final, unforgivable act he can't take back that completes his villain transformation, why open this can of worms with Sid a few episodes earlier? Why muddy the waters by presenting what are essentially the same heinous acts as if they are entirely morally different and never addressing the similarities, not once, the whole series? It's such a baffling decision, and the writers never really managed to salvage the idea, despite their desperate attempts in the third season to retcon her tryst with her mother's boyfriend as non-consensual. Oh yeah, sure, sure. If you steal the body of someone's partner and then get naked with that person and they make a sexual advance on you, yeah, even though you tricked them into thinking you were someone they were romantically involved with and put yourself in an intimate situation with them, they assaulted you. They should have known better and gotten the consent form in triplicate. Somebody let faux Livia from Fringe know. I guess Peter was actually taking advantage of her. People talk about sex and all I think about is having my face pushed into wet glass. Anyways, whatever. Sid was a promising young woman with her whole life ahead of her, and are we really gonna let one mistake mess our positive interpretation of the character up? I'll try to put it out of my mind. And what better way to distract myself than the utter spectacle of David and Farouk's showdown that kicks off the finale. I lamented that the first season finale's climactic psychic showdown boiled down to the tired old two colors of energy blasting each other until the hero's color wins. And I'm happy to report that Legion steps up its game enormously when it comes to the creative forms these cognitive confrontations take. Dance battles and sumo matches and flashy displays of conjuration, all culminating in this spectacular, shape-shifting light show in the sky. For all the talk of how utterly unstoppable Farouk will be if he ever finds his real body again, 
Farouk proves fairly stoppable when David uses a Division III depowering device to turn their cosmic altercation into a bar fight. Sid arrives to kill David, but he manages to survive until his powers return and saps the memories that have made her mistrust him from her head, so that she's brainwashed into being his girlfriend again. And though they have Farouk in custody, Division Three is tipped off to the ominous message from the future that David is a potential perpetrator of apocalyptic crimes to come. So Division Three is faced with a choice. Do we imprison David, who seemed to get a little too ruthless in his pursuit of Farouk there, but has spent all season saving our asses, or do we side with Farouk, a man so evil that the negative energy emanating from his dead body was enough to drive men to suicide? Well, the choice is obvious. Realizing that Division 3 wants to institutionalize him all over again, David slips his confinement and makes his escape, egged on by the increasingly erratic and numerous voices in his head to become more than himself, to become the titular Legion. And that's Legion Season 2. Noah Hawley stated that Season 1 was about an insane man in a sane world, while Season 2, by contrast, would be about a sane man in an insane world, obviously reflected in how innately trusting Division 3 and all his friends are of the horrendously monstrous Farouk, yet how conniving and duplicitous and untrusting they are when it comes to him. But at the same time, Season 3 is also clearly about David becoming the bad guy. The writers must be familiar with Rorschach and the Punisher, because they knew that David getting too bloody in his quest for vengeance wasn't going to do shit to convince audiences he's a villain now, since we all love to see the bad guys get brutalized. So they felt it necessary to do the brainwashing Sid into sleeping with him thing to seal the evil deal. But as a consequence, I kind of ended the season liking none of the characters. The Division 3 team may have reasons to not trust David, but they're just going to let Farouk walk? It's not like their captures are mutually exclusive. And no. The giant cope that audiences were clinging to when this first aired did not come to pass in Season 3. Division 3 are acting of their own volition. They are not all secretly brainwashed by Farouk into acting like fools. Which is good, because if they were, then you're just in Star Wars prequel defense territory anyways. Yeah, it's fine that all the characters are acting irrationally, because the villain is secretly clouding all their judgment. And David had less of a villain arc, and mostly just did one really bad thing. Although the thing is so bad that I'm not a fan of him anymore either. Forget series spanning descents into despicability, like Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Lester Nygaard from the first season of Fargo is probably the best example of a character that goes from sympathetic anti-hero to love-to-hate villain over the course of a single season. It took me a moment. Then I remembered Noah Hawley also wrote that. So, not entirely sure where his mojo went. What about Blondie? There ain't no Blondie no more. That's not the only unflattering comparison I can make to the first season of Fargo. Legion introduces John Hamm as a narrator who peppers thought experiments and parables throughout the episodes. Don't expect anything mind-blowing. He does the allegory of the cave in one scene. What are you going to wow me with next? The scorpion and the frog? These cutaways all sort of have their dots connected by the end, when you realize they're about Division 3's growing often unfair mistrust of David, as well as David's growing lack of compassion and the delusional belief that he isn't a good person and doesn't deserve love. Or maybe the delusional belief is that he is a good person and does deserve love. It's up for interpretation and is the crux of his now hostile conversations with Sid in the show's final year. Compare that to the dropping the glove off the train parable at the tail end of Fargo. Not stylish in any way, but when it came to insight into the characters, it was utter perfection. Again, that's the issue with Legion Season 2. It's dressed to the nines in glorious presentation, but the story and characters it's presenting wouldn't be able to stand on their own without all that style serving as a crutch. I hesitate to say it's truly style over substance, since there's still plenty of substance to be found in Season 2, but it doesn't substantiate into anything greater than its parts at the end of the day. I think we saw that as an intervention. You tried to gas me. Not me personally, if that makes any... It doesn't. Seemingly picking up on my fears that I'm not all that sympathetic toward any of these characters anymore, the Legion writers kick off the third and final season with a premiere episode that focuses on an entirely new character, Time Traveler Switch. Switch follows the cautious guidance of audio tapes left by her vanished time-traveling father and utilizes her abilities with trepidation, but sees the opportunity to truly push her powers to the limit when she picks up on feelers that David and his newly founded cult have been putting out across the globe. In the wake of last season's falling out with all his friends, David has decided that this future simply doesn't work for him. So he's been sending out cryptic, telepathic wanted ads. Looking for someone who can travel back in time with me? You'll get paid after we get back. Must bring your own weapons. 
I have never done this before, safety not guaranteed. After sailing switched down his chocolatey river of paranoid schizophrenia, she agrees to join forces with David, aiding him in his goal of traveling back in time to prevent Farouk from ever inhabiting his body in his infancy, and failing that, traveling back to his father's first showdown with Farouk and making sure Daddy finishes the job this time. Given David is brainwashing his cult into emulating his increasingly infantile attitude, and MK Ultra's the male carry into playing tech support for the team too, it's implied that Switch is also being compelled to do David's bidding due to his telepathic influence. Exploiting the powers of a younger mutant despite the physical and psychological distress it inflicts on them in an effort to reclaim your body just like Farouk in Season 1, plus traveling back in time to execute a villain for crimes they have yet to commit rather than seeking a peaceful solution with the benefit of prophecy just like future Sid in Season 2. David is replicating all the moves that left him feeling wronged in the first place. Pay it forward! Uh, no, that's not what that means at all. David's journey to villainy in Season 2 left me cold, but I will say that now that he's arrived at his destination, Legion is handling the concept much more organically. At times, his petulant, I want to be both revered like a god and baby like a toddler thing is a tad too on the nose, but other than that, I found his sinister lack of empathy in Year 3 to be natural and oddly existentially understandable. I do not subscribe to the notion that good villains need to see themselves as the heroes of their own stories, as I'm a huge sucker for out right evil bad guys, but the idea that David can forgive any action in pursuit of his goal, no matter how heinous, because if he succeeds, the timeline gets reset and all the bad stuff he did goes away, actually makes twisted sense. Though it is a humanizing touch that he isn't entirely cold and ends justify the means. Yeah, saying what's so funny about peace, love, and understanding after you massacre everyone on Division 3's spaceship all you want because you promised to set everything right. But we all saw how giddy you were getting when you were turning the tables on your friends turned rivals. I should have killed you the first time we met. Yeah. David wasn't the only one getting giddy as he worked his way through Division 3 one by one. I was too. The pace of Legion Season 2 tended to drag at times, and Season 3 manages to tighten things up a fair bit. It's essentially two episodes of Switch onboarding, two action-heavy episodes as David battles Time Demons and Division 3, two flashback episodes that show how Charles Xavier met his wife, how he met the Shadow King, and how the Shadow King possessed David. And then the grand finale. David's battle with Division 3 among the stars is probably the highlight of the season. The show really comes alive as we watch watch David work his way through the Division 3 boss rush, and each confrontation is fascinating, be it because of how he's outmaneuvering each of the superpowers he's pitted against, or because of the emotional resentment simmering between he and the latest person to stand in his way. Too late. On the less compelling side of the coin are the Time Demons, fourth dimensional monsters that come crawling out of the paradoxical woodwork whenever the timeline becomes too destabilized. They're certainly inspired visually, but again, you're never going to find a person alive who will say a bad thing about Legion's visuals, and if you do, throw them into clockworks because they've lost their mind. But narratively, the Time Demons sort of fall into the had-to-give-characters-something-to-do territory. Their only purpose in any given episode seems to be giving characters who otherwise had no significance to that episode's plot something to fight in a trippy action sequence right up to and including in the series finale. They're also all over the place in terms of threat. The all-powerful David is brought to his knees by two of them, yet Sid and the Carries, who are essentially just incredibly combat-ready humans, mow through a horde of them. They're level-scaled to an almost oblivion degree. The Charles Xavier flashback episodes are engaging, despite slowing the tempo down a bit. I'm not all that much of an X-Men guy, my favorite X-Men related pieces of media are Logan and then probably this, and I've spent roughly half the video bitching about this. Still, this glimpse at Professor X's history is fun to watch, with a cute courtship between he and David's mother, and some classic hero in the villain's lair material as he uses a prototype of Cerebro to track down Farouk and winds up the Shadow King's guest of honor. I also found it quite neat how these two episodes both begin as full-scale flashback episodes, only for present-day David to show up halfway through and interfere with the historic events when I least expected him. I mean, he is time traveling after all. I should have seen it coming, but I never did. It's a unique way to integrate otherwise lore heavy flashback episodes into the ongoing main narrative. And when you heard I was visiting, what can I say? I love a free meal. <laughs>
In my breakdown of what types of episodes are on offer in Season 3, the mathematicians among you may have noticed that my count was short by one. That would naturally be Legion's obligatory full-episode astral plane thought experiment that obliterates the show's momentum just as events were hurtling toward a climax. Though, before I get too sassy about it, let me clarify that I actually do like this one. David wiped all of Sid's memories during his Division 3 airship raid to neutralize her body-swapping powers, leaving her mind as a symbolic baby adrift on the astral plane. Oliver and Melanie who have retired to live in peace on the astral plane, adopt the baby consciousness of the amnesiac Sid, and decide to do a boyhood with her, an entire second childhood, lived out in full on the astral plane, while only a few hours go by in the real world. It's an endearing little fairy tale, with Oliver and Melanie teaching Sid self-reliance, compassion, and harmony with the world, while a devilish figure played by Jason Mantzoukas attempts to steer her and other lost minds in the realm toward the sinful world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What you got today? And baby. Have you told her about the Holocaust yet? The... Well, Gotta tell her. Prepare her, Oliver. Again, this fairy tale is sweet and simple, which is good. Given that Legion will ultimately end its series finale on a nurture-over-nature message, it's nice that we get a clear, straightforward setup parable for that theme here, especially since the finale is somewhat rushed and sloppy with the theme. Also, the conclusion of the episode where Jemaine Clement and Jason Mantzoukas have a battle for a woman's soul in the form of a ludicrously corny rap battle was probably the biggest I can't fucking believe what I'm watching moment I've had with television in my entire life. Because of the sheer audacity of it, and because even on a rewatch I still kind of can't believe it, I enjoy it. But I know the scene is divisive. I've seen people say it was the moment that officially cemented Legion's place as one of their favorite series of all time. I've also seen people say it was the moment that made them quit the show forever. And there's only like 90 minutes of show left after the rap battle. But that's the sunk cost fallacy. I'm the old wizard who lives in the shoe. The slick Mac Daddy from the Ice Cube. That brings us to the finale. While the surviving Division 3 members, sans patonomy, whom the show kind of forgot existed, protect the baby David from time demons that threaten to unfold the fabric of reality, present David finally successfully arrives in the past to help his dad take on Farouk. However, a wrench is thrown in their plans to two-team the Shadow King when present day Farouk travels back as well to even the odds. As far as finale setups go, Eh, again, time demons, could take them or leave them, it's all sort of filler material. But getting back to the core David vs. Shadow King conflict is undeniably enticing, especially since they just doubled the trouble. Well, I suppose this makes us dance partners. While David withstands Farouk's assault, the little brute, Charles and the older, wiser Farouk actually decide to talk matters out. Realizing that he's actually grown to care for David as a person after an entire lifetime of living in his head, and presumably also realizing that his past self is getting his ass whipped in the other room, and you better make peace before the clock in San Dimas runs out and he dies 35 years in the past, Farouk proposes a temporal truce. By showing his younger self visions of the future, he will prevent himself from ever inhabiting David's body in the first place, so long as Charles agrees to raise the boy as his own. Again, the nurture over nature thing is a bit of an odd note to end the show on. I guess it makes sense that a dad with superpowers would be able to provide David with more guidance than his adopted family, but at the same time, there was never any indication that his adoptive parents were anything other than idyllic. In fact, David's sister Amy seemed to be a major source of emotional support for him and the finale rather perplexingly neglects to mention both the imminent reversal of her murder or the tragic twist of fate that now she and David will never meet. And despite everyone resolving their issues peacefully, there are some mixed messages when it comes to redemption as well. Mass-murdering monster Farouk's heart is permitted to grow three sizes today. Meanwhile, characters note that David is simply too far gone and can only become a good person through the miracle of time travel altering his destiny. Still, despite the let's all get along ending, we aren't denied one final spectacular astral plane deathmatch before the ceasefire, complete with a full cover of Pink Floyd's Mother. It's a very Legion finale, with all the good and bad that statement entails. I had him! Yes, I saw the blood. What did you think, I was gonna kill him with words? David, stop. The deal is struck, the timeline is reset, and before their lives begin anew, Sid and David have one last farewell. Sid tells David to be a good boy this time, even though everything was mostly Farouk's fucking fault. And that's the Legion series finale. All the crimes and deaths are undone, and everybody gets a pat happy ending, so it is at least a surface level satisfying conclusion, but the more you ruminate on it, the more you realize how deeply non-committal Legion's ending is. What are the fates of all these characters? Tell you what, we've been using our imaginations enough to make this show, why don't you, the audience, use your imagination for once? 
Step into Switch's time hallway with me. I want to go back to my Fargo video, specifically my thoughts on season three, the most legiony of all the seasons, and more specifically, the ending. In that video, I mentioned that the oddities of the season might distance audiences, but also that audiences should trust the writers, they're going somewhere with all this. I praised Fargo season three's controversial, ambiguous finale, as it served as the perfect culmination to the themes of the season. And while Legion introduced thought-provoking themes and bonkers sci-fi plot points and dramatic moral quandaries throughout its latter two seasons, at the end of the day, the finale leaves you with the distinct feeling that it wasn't going anywhere with any of this. Much like David, the writers seem to say, things have become too big of a mess to work through ourselves. Nothing a little reboot via time travel can't fix. Lessons in Time Travel Chapter Zero who we were does not dictate who we will be. But often, it's a pretty good indication. So that's Legion. It's a truly stylish series that takes some inspired risks I'm amazed even the There Is No Box FX was willing to roll the dice on. In the overstuffed superhero marketplace where it's all too easy to forget large chunks of a film five minutes into your drive home from the theater, Legion is a beacon of creativity with some undeniably indelible duels and dream worlds that I will remember till the day I die. It's also a show that frequently focused on spectacular visuals at the expense of giving characters proper motivation, shortchanged its supporting cast, and wasted screen time on thought experiments because Noah Hawley thought they were neat but then forgot to integrate them into the overall narrative. Given the utterly unique nature of the project, I can understand why so many people hold Legion in such high regard, despite its imperfections. There really is nothing else quite like it, and despite my complaints, I'd still recommend the series, especially thanks to the strength of the first season. Just go in with the foreknowledge that this ongoing card trick of a series that's been dazzling you ends with the magician flipping the table over and running away, rather than revealing its secrets or closing on a final flourish. That's all I've got. I'll let the mouse on my desk play me out. Violence, in other words, is ignorance. Figure your shit out. That's my, what I'd say.